Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. JP Finley, of course, you know where to find him. 106.7 The Fan, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Daily with B. Mitch, who will be with me tomorrow in Detroit. Excited for that. We get JP today, and of course, you can also catch him on NBC4. Uh, and JP, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be selfish here first, if that's okay with you. Um, I'm, I want to ask you about what it's like to cover a draft in person, because I've spent so many drafts over the years on the beat in Ashburn covering the, the press conferences, and we're all sitting there, you know, waiting for the picks to come in and all that kind of stuff, which is fun when you get tipped off and you know the pick and you're, you're frantically typing knowing that everyone in the room is watching you um, or is about to see your tweet. That's, that's a good time. But what's it like to actually be at the draft uh, like I will be and, uh, and obviously be Mitch will be this year? Uh, it's cool, man. It's fun. You know, the draft has become this, like, crazy event where it's packed and it's, um, you know, I haven't been to one since COVID, so I, I can only imagine how much bigger they've gotten. Um, but it's a long day, bro. Like from a straight working capacity, assuming, are you just going to do your show? Or are you going to stick around and try to be there oh, to yes. talk to the pick after? Yeah, or? no, we are. So look, thankfully, uh, and you know, we've said this on the show before, but so people know I'm scheduled to get a few minutes with the pick, which you'll hear, uh, on the fan and on the team 980, our simulcast coverage. And we'll put it on, on digital and everything. So yeah, I've got a flight in the morning, some digital stuff I'm doing during the day show from four to seven and then yeah, working. Luckily they're picking it too though. So at least the pick comes early, you know? Yeah, for sure. And one, if you are already scheduled to get them, that makes a big difference. Um, you'll be, it's, it's shocking how much media is required of these kids once they're picked. So it's like they have generally like two TV broadcasts or maybe they like simulcast television broadcast now between ESPN and NFL. And then now the last one I've, I've worked was John Allen. So that was probably, you know, there's probably been some consolidation in media since then, but he, I mean, there were like four radio hits and that, and everything just takes time. And eventually you recognize all these dudes want to do is get to their draft party, which they, you know what I mean? Is waiting for them. Right. Um, but it is really cool to experience somebody's, you know, dream coming true and becoming a pro ball player. Like it's, there's nothing like that energy. And, and I think you'll, enjoy it man i think it'll be really cool yeah no i'm excited it's gonna be a lot of fun of course we're live there uh you got b mitch there tomorrow uh so full coverage all day long on 106.7 the fan of the team 980 and every single pick for the commanders of the 2024 nfl draft is on the team 980 so then we get to the pick itself um you you still dabble and sometimes even major in the information space like you you have so many great connections around the league and it does feel like the Ben Johnson thing all over again where everyone is saying it's one thing while also acknowledging especially here locally like yeah but the main decision makers aren't talking to anyone how do you think we've gotten to the point even if it's correct this time unlike Ben Johnson where everyone thinks the pick is going to be Jaden Daniels Well I think and as much as perhaps people tried to rewrite history on this, I think it's worth remembering that a big part of the Ben Johnson situation was him pulling out, right? Like, if he took the interview and nailed it, I think it's entirely possible everything looks different. <laughs> That's so, Yeah, totally fair. Like, it, it, I don't know that everybody was wrong. Maybe they were overestimating where it was going to land, and, and I know that DQ made a real impression and all those sorts of things but still i'm not sure entirely that if ben johnson doesn't just take that interview it doesn't go differently but whatever um it, it sure does seem like it's going to be Jaden. um i think Jaden is the right pick also i would add um but you're i i have never said done deal um i, I don't think many have because i think it's kind of a dangerous place to land with a group that's not telling you anything um I don't care a tremendous amount about the betting odds. Um, it does seem pretty similar, though, to last year with Stroud, who was going to be number two all along. And then Will Levis came out of nowhere, going to maybe even be number one, and then he ended up going in the second round. Um, you know, I, I think there's volatility when there's a lack of real information, and there's been a significant lack of real information. But uh, I think it's going to be Jaden, but you do have to allow that, Maybe these guys are intentionally leading everybody away 
or, or, or allowing people to lead themselves away from the real answer, we'll see. Yeah, that's the funny part about it, JP. It's like sometimes it just becomes everyone confirming themselves and know it all started kind of from nothing and it winds up whipping into this information vacuum tornado. Um, and I do kind of wonder about that here. And that, like, there was a story recently. Um, I won't th- like the conversation I had about it was off the record. So I'm going to be very intentionally vague here, but there was a story in DC sports within the last year that kind of grew legs. And I was talking to one of the decision makers, one of the power brokers that was involved in the story and asked them and they were asked about it uh, by someone else in the conversation. And they were like, yeah, no, that part's not true, but we just don't, it doesn't behoove us to, to, uh, turn it down or to not to tell anybody. So we just kind of let it run. And I also, there like is a part of me with Adam Peters, especially with the way he operated in San Francisco uh, and coming from that new England background, we know how secretive they are. And I kind of wonder if they're like, sweet, everyone thinks it's going to be Jaden and uh, we could be going another direction. And they also just could be Jaden. Sometimes the simplest and most straightforward path is the correct one. So it's just kind of funny how this has worked because everyone does acknowledge that while all the wind is blowing in the same direction. We don't really know what the origin point of that wind is, and we do know it's not actually the guy making the decision. I, I agree with all that entirely. The thing that maybe we're all just, like, overthinking is I, I think it's fairly clear that Jaden's the best prospect. Like, I, I just think he's the best player at number two, and all the rest of this is, like, a little bit of analytically-led stuff with Drake May. <clears throat> but, but just, like, we're all... In in a three month void of information, we're all just searching for something else, and there's nothing else really to see. So the guy that I actually think, if it, if the one percent that it's not Jaden, and I do want to, t- we'll spend the, the after this the rest of the time talking about Jaden and, and what it means here and why you think he's the best guy and all that. But the one guy that I can't get out of my head is actually not not May. It's McCarthy. And the reason I, I say that, one, I think he, he, for me, and Logan's in the same place for whatever it's worth, we have all three of those guys in the same tier. It's like McCarthy, May, uh, Daniels. They've all got different issues. They've all got different positives. And we actually both have McCarthy as, as two slightly ahead of Daniels with May coming in third. But the reason specific to Washington that I think that's really interesting is Peters has talked and Quinn has talked a lot about like the character and, and, and being yeah. a dude, being being a huge factor for them. And JJ fits that to a T. And by the way, he's really talented to, to make sure that the gap is not huge between uh, or on the football side. Like if that happens, if that 1% happens, like it, does that at least make sense to you? Or would you be like, I don't, I don't get what they're doing here. No, I, I like JJ. I kind of have JJ ahead of Drake, honestly. Yeah. Um, same. I, 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 um, when we were in Indy, I, yeah, I almost think it might have been you and I talking about this. I remember having a conversation with somebody that was just like, man, more and more, doesn't it seem like McCarthy could be their kind of guy? If it's leadership and winning and the locker room, like, that's all that dude does. And I get that people will be dismissive of it, and he did not throw a lot, and there, there are real questions, but all of it, I think you know me well enough. Hopefully, you know, the audience knows that I'm, I'm very willing to take positions throughout kind of my time as an analyst or reporter. <clears throat> but on this, I really don't think they have a bad route. There are routes I prefer. I think Daniels at two is the move. But I don't hate McCarthy. I don't hate Drake. I don't hate trading back and getting a boatload of picks and taking Penix. I like Penix. Like, I, I could go a million directions, and I think – I think they're in a really advantageous spot. I, for me, I, I think I saw you tweet this, like that they're kind of telling people the, the, the pick's not going to be moved and, and to not bother them with trades. I think, one, that could just be subterfuge to then allow for people to call tomorrow night at 7.30. Sure. But I, I, also, I also think, it, to your point, that I think I saw you made on Twitter, that like, if they're like, no, we love this kid, we can get him, this could change our franchise, we're taking him, there's, there's no trade in the world worth C.J. Stroud. There's no trade in the world worth Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen. Like, people can get so enamored with picks, but if you have a real elite franchise quarterback, if you have an answer to that question, there's no, there's no collection of draft picks worth that. 
So if that's what their mind is, I get it. Yeah. No, I'm 100% <laughs> with you. Like, I am perfectly okay with them doing just about anything. And part of that, too, is I trust this group to make themselves correct. Like, I actually trust the the structure and the people in place to make themselves right, nevertheless, get it right from a scouting perspective, which I think are two different things, but um, we don't talk about the make it right nearly enough until a guy fails, and we see, like, Zach Wilson. Now, Zach Wilson, I don't know if it was a get it right either. There's some issues there, but, like, clearly the Jets didn't help him out a whole lot, um, which brings us to Jaden Daniels. Why is he the right fit for Washington in your mind? Why are you so concrete in your take that, like, yeah, no, that's the right guy? I, like, this is weird because I don't think um, I don't think people think about him this way. But I think Daniels is the best passer of all the guys they're going to have the option to draft. And I think that's what's most important. Like, people get caught up in the athleticism and the running. I think he's a better passer than May or McCarthy. Maybe Penix, but the injuries are concerned with Penix. Like, I just think Jaden Daniels – beat you through the air better than anybody else. And that is the baseline at the beginning of the conversation for me, because ultimately the quarterback position is about throwing the ball. Then you add in the playmaking ability, you add in the, the real running ability. And I just, if I was in charge and I'm definitely not, I, I don't think it'd be <laughs> much. I don't think it'd be much of a decision. Like if you just, and, and dude, people that are like, Oh, well, you know, he's older. He's 23. And I think, I think five years from now, this will be the total norm. Between NIL and the transfer portal, like, I, I think you'll see more and more and more of these guys coming out at 23. Um, I, I think we'll look back on this as, like, a turning point draft where it's like, yeah, you know, especially the quarterback position where these guys are going to be making two, three mil for a college football season, they're going to stick around and get better. Um, the, the slight frame, I get it. It takes some big hits. I think, I mean, you would know better than me off with the nutrition and weightlifting. I, I think they can add strength to him and not necessarily like weight that would slow him down. But like I said, I don't have a problem with anybody. But to me, I don't think it's a hard decision to take Jaden at all. No, I, 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 the more I talk about him being the pick, the more excited I get because I think you're dead on on the, the passer stuff. Like he is fundamentally a guy that will sit back there. And he doesn't have necessarily, like the irony with the running is when he runs, it's like, okay, now it's home run threat. But he actually is not, like May, people are going to freak out about what I'm about to say, but just like stay tuned through the definition here. Like May is a better scrambler, right? Like if he, if you got a guy to run yeah. around and like in the same way that Caleb's like, this is Caleb's superpower. You run around and you got to make a, a left-handed Mahomesian whatever, like just make a play. Then Drake May's your guy. But if you got to sit back in the pocket and like dart a ball, throw with anticipation, like Jaden, Jaden anticipates in his quick release, like makes up for him not having quite as strong of an arm as the other guys. Um, and, and he's so precisely accurate. The ironic thing with Penix, actually, not to get too sidetracked on him, is like, I don't know if you saw Ben Solak charted all these guys. And he's like, Penix, even though the completion percentage is high, is one of the least accurate guys I've seen in, or charted in the last five years. Because his receivers were so good, he they made him right a ton. Where even though Jaden had incredible receivers at LSU, his ball placement was immaculate. And I think that's the thing that there is so much natural talent involved in that of just being able to judge where you need to put a ball and having the physical ability to actually do it that can kind of overcome any like again, Jaden's got a really good arm, but it's not an elite arm. But if you can get the ball yeah. where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there, that's the job. That's the position. And he does right. that at such a high level that I agree with you that even though he is 23 and that actually does affect like the ability to put on weight and stuff because he's kind of got more of his man body, but he can, he, he's got five, 10 pounds to spare. He, he, they can definitely add to his frame is like, he actually has more upside and more ceiling than I think a lot of people give him credit for because he's so polished already, because he does the single thing that you like as well as anybody in this draft. Dude, I, I totally agree. And I, I hate the notion that, like, Daniels is the safe pick and Drake's the upside pick. I mean, Daniels has improved so much in two years at LSU, which was like a functioning football program compared to the snake pit that ASU sounded like. I, I, he could continue to improve one. 
I think his biggest hole right now is like off schedule plays. Not when he's taken off and running, but like pocket. Like to your point, I think Drake is better if it's just a broken down pocket and you have to elongate a play and slide down the line of scrimmage. But I think a lot of that is because he processes so fast and he gets rid of the ball so fast that he's not in those situations nearly as often. I think, um, yeah, and to, just to add to that real quickly, JP, like his option to run is a different option than anyone else. Like most quarterbacks, you were like, extend the play, make a big play. Him, it's like you got through your progression, you see a seam, don't hesitate because that seam will disappear. And if you run through that seam, you are fast enough to get us 20 yards or 80 yards as he did against Alabama and Florida, which aren't exactly lacking for athletes. Right. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Uh, JP Finley with us for another minute or two here on the Hoffman show. The last part that I think is a really interesting to discuss with you is something that Tariko told us uh, when we had him on yesterday. Um, and he talked about how he thinks Jaden can handle the position in Washington. And that's, that's like, I think an underrated part of the evaluation here specifically, because we have seen it eat up quarterbacks, uh, many of them in the past where the pressure of being the Washington quarterback is just different than it is being many other cities. You know, you have a couple like, um, you know, ironically, Denver's actually a city that that is like this with the way they treat their football team out there. But um, Washington just comes with a different level of scrutiny and pressure. And Tariko was like, in talking to Brian Kelly and also watching this dude succeed at LSU, which is a pretty intense pressure cooker by college standards, I think he can handle the job. What do you make of kind of Jaden handling the job in Washington and what what kind of traps may lay out there for him considering ownership is very different than it has been under the previous 25 years of quarterbacks who have fallen into that trap? I think you've got for the first time in a long time organizational alignment to develop a kid and, and really protect and promote and you've got owner, GM, head coach, presumably all on board. I think I think Cliff can really help Jaden from a play calling and offensive standpoint. And I think they've built a staff that can sustain. If it goes really well and Cliff gets the head coaching job, like I think they can sustain that. Um, and the other thing is if, if they had an offensive head coach and it went really well and the OC would get hired anyway, like I, I think they could sustain that too. If the quarterback's the right guy, like they can handle whatever. Anyway, um, I think, you know, we had a uh, um, blanket on his name. We had a reporter from Baton Rouge on the podcast um, that has watched every single throw of Jaden Daniels' LSU career in person and has gotten to know him and, and wrote this really cool story about Jaden's, like, off-season training regimen and how he became a first-in, last-out guy. And two things that stood out with me, stood out to me from that piece are um, – both kind of speak to the person as far as being able to handle the job in D.C. Apparently, as a kid, Jaden Daniels' father would show him Joe Montana clips, and there's like an NFL Films thing. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I'm guessing you have. Where Niners teammates remember before they went on a game-winning drive in the Super Bowl, Joe Montana stopped in the huddle and was like, hey, look, there's John Candy. Like, it's a pretty yep. famous story, right? Yep, yep, yep. But the point of that is to just keep your poise in all situations. And his dad would show him that as a kid, which I just find interesting. And Jaden had a quote throughout the season, maybe, but definitely at the beginning of the season. And then at the beginning of the draft cycle, where it's like, you know, are you worried about the pressure? And he's like, man, I had to come to LSU and replace Joe Burrow. Like, I'm cool with pressure. Right. Think about what that looked like. I mean, Burrow's a hero, a hero. And he started the next year. Yeah. I mean, that people, it is funny because during the draft process, because Jaden took the leap that was in some way Burrow esque, people wanted to compare the two. And I'm like, no, Joe Burrow threw 60 touchdowns and six picks. No one gets to be compared right. to Burrow. But the pressure of replacing a dude who threw for 60 touchdowns and six picks in that place, like they are nuts down there. Um, and I mean that mostly as a compliment, but also kind of not. Um, they are guts down there about their football and about LSU. And so for him to go into that and step up the way he did is, is big time. So I think it's, it's about as good of a, a prep as you could get 
uh, for Washington and, and kind of the environment around. So it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, JP, B. Mitch, tomorrow, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. B. Mitch will be in Detroit. JP holding it down in D.C. And, of course, also never forget the Beltway Football Podcast with JP and Mitch Tischler. Always a great listen as well. JP, as always, appreciate your time here on the show, sir. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking over the next couple of days as this thing finally goes down. Okay, brother. Good to talk to you always. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.